My name is uh, Brady, Brady Durr, and uh, thank you for coming tonight for the uh, Forward No Closures Meetup. It's, uh, you know, I try to do some events locally in Fort Worth, but with people's schedules and logistics and uh, getting around DFW and, and, and note investing is really a almost a 50 state market. It just makes sense to try to do some of these events on online. And um, recently, as I realized in the Texas market, there's just not a great not a great place to buy distress notes. They're just not there. They're very expensive. And um, I had a real a, a company that I've been trying to get non-performing notes from in California. And their prices didn't quite align, but um, they presented me this interesting little deal. They didn't know what to do with it. It was a, they were in a second lien, they foreclosed. Now they had to make good on the first. They put this weird lease purchase agreement thing there. And uh, they asked me if I wanted to buy it. And I was like, uh, I'm not sure. I need to ask more questions. And that's when I reached out to the offices of, of Alan Keshker and started to learn about wraps and, and wrap mortgages and how to paper this stuff correctly. And, uh, you know, they helped me through that process and another one. And then I got a third one I'm trying to, to close on. And so it's just, it's been a very interesting way to uh, get to get property, get property without having to be having to get you don't have to get a hard money lender you 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 there's just so much you you can get into subject to with a, a lot less capital you do need capital because you got to keep the rears up and you are responsible for the underlying lien so you need to have that be able to be true to your word with that but you know how are you going to get a, a note like and i'll show you through some of the scenarios you know how are you going to buy a note in, on a nice property in texas for thirty thousand dollars you know, and get into that, you know, it's just, and then get 13% yield out of it. I mean, it's just not, not common, right? But that stuff is, that's more common if you um, look at the, the wrap mortgage. So we'll go into some of that stuff tonight. Let me go and share my screen. And that's why when I first closed, I got my first uh, one close with, with Alan Keshker, I was like, I want to be better at this. I want to be a better client. Would you, would you explain this process so I can be better at it? He was like, Sure. <laughs> of course I would. So anyway, that's what we're here tonight. Talk about the uh, mortgage wraps, the complete guide with um, Alan Keshker. He wrote the he wrote the book on this. So um, I am excited to be here. Let's connect. Connect me on LinkedIn and Facebook. Probably quite a few of you here because I got your connection from LinkedIn and sent you an email every now and then through my, my database. Um, I'm active on Facebook, Instagram meet up and uh, I have a YouTube channel as well. This I'll, I'll probably post this video to YouTube, the YouTube channel, Mortgage Medic USA. Um, so I focus on non-performing first in Indiana, Michigan. And now I've added subject two with reps into our repertoire because it makes sense in Texas. And I've got a great team now. <laughs> this was my exit strategy to retire from the uh, Air Force. Um, I wanted to execute my own vision for my life, not someone else's vision for my life, i.e. a boss and feedbacks and appraisals. And uh, so that's that's kind of why I my kids. I love being at home and uh, being retired with my PD214. Um, I'm not guru, I'm not perfect. And uh, and so I look forward to learning from your experiences that you have and, and from the people I meet. I, I love to bring these experts and share them with you as well. But that's about me. So like here, there's just a little land contract I picked up in South Bend, Indiana. Um, so we're, we're actually, uh, my JV partner said, hey, let's rehab this thing to get it to 90K. And so that's what we're doing now. We're actually rehabbing this thing in South Bend. And, uh, you know, I only picked this, my purchase price was $6,700. We're going to be about 4500 into the rehab. And we can sell it for 90 and, and even seller finance it. So you know, that's, that's kind of some of the things that I'm, I'm doing in South Bend. Here's a Huber Heights there. We'll get this back in foreclosure in May. Um, it's got a lot of, a lot of land and, um, you know, BPOs, when you get BPOs on these things, they're like 125. Yeah, right. Not, not the condition that it was in, but the RV is 125. And I had a couple of realtors tell me that. So hopefully we'll be able to sell at the auction for 60 and uh, walk away with some cash in. At 31 percent if not i'll be happy to take this back and take these all these parcels here i can sell these parcels off this parcel is can be developed on and there's another parcel here can be developed on so um 
Yeah, and this is a sub too that uh, Alan Kesker's office helped me close on. Um, you know, the estimated yearly ROI on this if, uh, is 16% when I do a rat note. Um, we've got it right now on the MLS. Um, and I'm, I'll happily sell or finance that one as well. And here's another one. Uh, we closed with the Kesker's office. Um, this one was the, uh, the, sub, the second's buyer. They didn't know what to do with it. And Alan's office helped me paper this correctly. You know, 13% ROI is not, you know, not too horrible uh, for Texas, but um, they already had an end buyer in it and it cash flows from day one. And so, um, you know, and, and then there's some back end equity. So they're like $56,000 in back end equity if they ever decide to sell the house and move on, there's a little paycheck coming. So anyway, this is kind of what subject to do. So when you analyze deals, this is some of the work that goes into the deal analysis. Um, anyway, so our objectives tonight are to get some updates on Texas legislation, because Allen is very involved uh, with the legislation that's going on. The Keshker group specifically um, is very involved in what's going on with the Texas legislation to the point he's like sits next to the senators and the staffers that are making these rules. And the point that he's actually at the Capitol Hill and they're asking him these couple of questions. So he's teamed up with a lot of real estate and big name real estate investors in the Texas market. And so if anybody knows what's going on, what, what's going to happen, the final outcome is going to be, it's going to be him. He's going to share that with us tonight. So, um, well, the proposed final outlet still got to go through Congress. They got to vote it in, but he knows what the, what the language looks like. And so we're going to talk about wrap mortgages, what they are, going to the forms required. We're going to talk about the contracting process and all the different forms. There's a lot more forms than just the trick one to four. Um, he'll show us how to fill out the one to four and what parts we get to omit. Um, the contracting process. And if we have some time available, if he still has time, we can go through your, your question and answers. So feel free to drop those Q and A's into the uh, chat roll, everyone. And uh, Mike, thanks for that feedback that you see both of us, appreciate it. So now I'm gonna stop share. And Alan, it is all on you. Good deal, good deal, Brady, I, I appreciate it. Um, so let, let me introduce myself. Uh, Alan Sester, uh, have a, a law and title office. A uh, long time ago, my, my uh, builder clients uh, asked me to, to start closing their transactions. I said, no, no, I don't, we, don't, we don't do that stuff here. Then we had some litigation in regard to a $3 million house, and I looked at one of the settlement statements and saw what the policy premiums were and it said all of a sudden we do close these transactions. Um, and so we, uh, we got started uh, back in about 04, and um, uh, I don't know if some of y'all missed it, but in 08, there was a little bit of a recession. And so... We had to uh, we had to uh, adjust, and so we started doing some of these creative financing things. Uh, you know, mortgage wraps back in 08, 09, 10, 11, 12 were were prevalent because no one could get loans. Um, and so then from there, we we kind of uh, have morphed into really just a a, a title office that that specializes in uh, investor transactions. Uh, while we're uh, a conventional title office, escrow officers, etc., and we. We close uh, uh, conventional transactions. Great majority of our work is, is investor transactions. And out of those, uh, 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 greater than 50% greater than are gonna be mortgage wraps and subject twos. And so that's how I kind of got uh, involved in the legislature uh, when they were trying to come in and, and move our cheese. Uh, me, some of my clients, the Texas 100, all in force and so let's let's don't move our cheese just yet and so that's how we got involved in that so uh, as as you said we're going to go over uh, uh allegedly a comprehensive guide to wraps but it can always grow hopefully with the question and answer session afterwards we can we can see some changes to it so let me see if i can work this technology and share my uh my screen here before we go on what um, do you want to share what's going on with the legislature now or afterwards uh, I, I created a little slide, uh, so let's let's do it. Uh, I wanted to talk about what wraps are. Just uh, if we have some folks who are 100% unaware of what they are, then we can we can have that definition first. Excellent. Is that good? Sounds perfect. All right. So let me uh, get this thing started in presentation mode. Uh, is is that the page and presentation? Perfect. I see your I see your full screen. Okay. All right. Good deal. Uh, so so we're talking about mortgage wraps. But let, let's start at the very, very beginning with a, a definition. And I've, I've tried to, to pare this thing down. A lot of times people are uh, 
how um, anxious uh, or, or you know, feel threatened by these things because they're, they're weird. A mortgage wrap is seller financing of a property that doesn't pay off the underlying mortgage. That's all it is. Um, the, the bottom line is the, the property is conveyed, it's sold over, it's not a lease purchase option. The property is deeded over to the buyer and that existing mortgage stays in place uh, and the, um, the uh, seller, borrower of that existing mortgage is gonna remain liable for that existing mortgage um, through our documents that we draft up. The, the, the buyer now becomes liable over to the, to the seller for that. But the key here is it's just seller financing. It's very, very simple once you get your arms around it. So with, with that definition, we end up with two different types of seller financing uh, in, in, in our world. Uh, there's, there's no underlying loan, and so you're just seller financing that. They, you know, they, they say it's owned free and clear. And then the other side of the other, other type of seller financing is there is an underlying loan. So this includes mortgage wraps, subject tos, uh, assumptions, those are all falling under the, the other side here, the underlying loan uh, existing side. So let's, let's, let's define some of those things. Um, when, when someone says subject to, all they're saying is they're taking the property, seller's no longer involved at all in terms of any equity interest. Uh, you're not paying any overage over to the seller. Um, that, that buyer is really just stepping into the shoes of the seller and that seller, uh, uh, for all intents and purposes, goes away and they're not involved. Um, there's uh, something called a qualified assumption. Those don't exist anymore. That's back in uh, 80, 84 when, when FHAs were assumable, VAs were assumable. And that means you're assuming that mortgage with the permission of the lender. Uh, as opposed to non-qualified assumption, that's what, that's what we do. And that's the, the buyers assuming the underlying loan or at least the obligations of the underlying loan without permission of the lender. Non-qualified assumption, and subject to our synonyms. Um, so if you hear someone say, um, uh, I'm taking this by assumption, they're taking it subject to. With the, the last one being a mortgage wrap, uh, at least in my, my definition, my terminology, uh, a mortgage wrap is when the seller is going to carry a promissory note that's, that's larger than the, the existing payoff uh, or the payoff of the existing mortgage. Um, so essentially that seller is cash flowing uh, that's what you were talking about in your example. It was cash, cash flowing $325. That means it's a mortgage wrap. Bigger note wrapping around a, a smaller note. Now, to, to keep it confusing, because we got to make sure this is confusing so the lawyers have to be hired, uh, I use the term uh, mortgage wrap to mean all of these. Uh, it, it, a wrap, and, and you'll see why in a second, uh, they're, they're really not different in terms of the structuring of these things. So whenever I say mortgage wrap, I mean all of these. Uh, unless I specifically uh, call out subject to or, or, or assumption. I still use the word assumption to, uh, to mean subject to. I've tried to stop. I'm too old. I can't stop. So you'll hear me say assumption and subject to. Um, so let, let's talk about the legislation uh, with, with those definitions in mind. This, this legislation that's coming out, it's uh, Senate Bill 42, uh, and they're proposing some changes. Uh, one of the, one of the, most important changes, and you, and you would think it wouldn't be because the SAFE Act actually requires the same thing, but after five, tw five transactions in a 12-month rolling period, you have to be licensed or have a registered RMLO, uh, uh, residential mortgage loan officer, loan originator, sorry, loan originator, uh, attached to, to your company. It's, it's a, outside the scope of, of, of this uh, webinar as to, as to that attaching uh, issue, and, it's, and again, it's not final, but we can, we can discuss that later when, when things are final. But what we used to do under the, under the uh, SAFE Act was A, either ignore it, and we're doing more than five transactions in a 12 month rolling period, and there was no teeth in, in the SAFE Act really. Uh, under this proposed legislation, there's teeth, substantial teeth, and so we want to avoid violating this new, this new statute coming out. Um, another change is you have to close with the law or title office. A lot of people were doing tabletop closings, uh, just getting some, some loan documents, creating their own settlement statement, and closing these transactions without the assistance of the law or title office. Uh, now, if you do that, the transaction's void. And, and that's obviously uh, problematic. Uh, if you go out there and try to uh, give a defaulting buyer and you go out there and try to get that property back, uh, if they're 
if they go and lawyer up and that lawyer takes a look at this new statute, it means they can say, go pound sand, you can't get your property back. You still sue them for the promissory note, you just can't get the property. Another change uh, is, is the 5016 disclosure. Uh, uh, under the Texas Property Code, Section 5.016, the, the, you, have to, you have to disclose what I call the nuts and bolts of the underlying mortgage. Um, it, it's, it's really just a, a beefed up disclosure of this is a mortgage wrap. Um, the reason this is important is because uh, a failure to do this allows the buyer to rescind the transaction. That means that if you're two years along in this transaction uh, and, and this uh, buyer goes into default, uh, you go to start foreclosing against the, this buyer and uh, there's no 5016 disclosure in the file, what have you, then they can say, you know what? Uh, okay, I'll give you the property back, but all of the money that I've paid you over the past two years, all of the taxes that I've paid, all the, uh, the, the money that I put in improving the property, uh, pay me all that back, and then I'll give you your property back. So obviously that's that's problematic. Um, there's a um, extensive uh, enforcement and, and and penalty power power by the finance commission. Uh, if you don't comply with this thing, as opposed to the to the Safe Act or you know Dodd Frank, even uh, people were kind of ignoring that a bit. Um, this this statute had been designed because people were uh, uh, taking advantage of people. You know, you have uh, someone that comes in with a hundred of these properties they take by subject to, then they go seller finance wrap these transactions. These people make monthly payments for two, three, four, five, six months. They weren't pushing the money back over to the underlying lender. And so, you know, out of El Paso, this one fellow stole two, two million dollars. Guy out of Dallas uh, did about 40 uh, of these. Now he's uh, got free room and board with the county um, correctional facilities now. Uh, down in the valley, it happened a, a bit. Here in Austin, Dove Springs, uh, it happened. So they're 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 wanting to change that and take away the ability for these bad actors to do this. And so th this the statute's quite quite toothy. All right. So so back to to how and what's of these things. So the the strategy that that we're doing, and, and I consider I consider this strategy to be the absolute most powerful investment strategy out there. Uh, because you can leverage your dollars. Um, I had someone come up to me and said, hey, I have a half million dollars. I want to go out and buy two, maybe three properties uh, and, and keep them as rentals, what have you. Uh, I just turned around and said, well, wh why don't we go out and, and buy, uh, uh, you know, 100 properties using your half million dollars. Um, you can leverage your funds considerably, and, and here's, here's how. You locate the property. You, you purchase that property by assumption subject to then uh, to, to, to convince them, um, and I'll mention, uh, I'll mention some documents during this, uh, uh, just email, you'll, you'll have contact information at the end of it. Email uh, if you want our RAP FAQ document, if you want that 5016 document or anything else I reference, just email uh, at the email address we're gonna have at the end of this and we'll, we'll send that on to you. So we have a, a very, very good RAP FAQ document. It's, I attempted to draft it in non-legalese, uh, I probably didn't succeed completely, but it's, it's designed to be for the unknowing uh, buyer or seller to, to introduce them to what the, the wrap or, or, or subject to is. Um, if, you, if you're going out there and you see something listed for sale or lease, that's a good prospect. That means that that seller does not need to sell that property, pay off the mortgage in order to advance to their next endeavor. Uh, so that's how you can locate those. Uh, then you go out and locate in buyer. We have people who either uh, get a property under a contract uh, to purchase by subject to, they have a long uh, option period, so simultaneously they'll locate the end buyer and they'll have simultaneous close. That saves you the closing costs. That's the, the best way to do it. Others will, will take that property subject to, uh, put some lipstick and rouge on it, and then go out there and try to find a, an end buyer. You can, you can sell it conventional selling. Uh, you'll, you'll just get the, the one-time hit and won't cash flow. Um, locating the end buyer and enter into a ABBC transaction just allows you to cash flow like, like you showed uh, earlier, Brittany. So you're gonna close the, the, the BC side via the wrap transaction. Um, and we'll get into to, to how on, on those things. This is a, an overview real quick. And you don't have to have substantial equity in these things. Um, you, you know, a, a cash flow of 300 to $600 per property is good once you start compounding the number of properties that you have. 
Uh, also, your amortization tables are going to diverge, which means that every single month, that older mortgage uh, is, is going to amortize faster uh, than that newer mortgage, and so you get more and more equity every month. So that's that's the strategy uh, and and the global how-to. Um, everyone's going to ask about uh, due on sale clause. Uh, due on sale clause currently is a is a non-issue. Uh, I always say it's the most uh, talked about uh, item uh, of a mortgage wrap transaction and the least seen issue. Uh, I, I have had three occasions. Uh, where a note was called due uh, out of the thousands of, of wraps that have closed. Uh, and I say it's usually uh, related to some silliness by the parties. Uh, my favorite was uh, a seller uh, sold a uh, property that had a home equity uh, loan on it. And so uh, from a small bank uh, local, and uh, she took all of her closing documents, went to that bank, uh, put the documents down said, I sold that property. Now I want to get a home equity loan on this new property. And, uh, Small banks are more sensitive to this. Home uh, banks with home equity loans are more sensitive to this. So it's really just a, a convergence of uh, a comedy of errors. And, and so they called it new, new. The fix then on that, and, and the fix that I uh, suggest on, on all occasions, is um, to deed the property back over to the seller, show the bank that, that deed, and then deed the property back to the buyer. It's a cat and mouse game. It looks like you're you know, maybe, maybe doing something a little sneaky. Uh, certainly nothing wrong with, with that fix, and it's worked on, on all three occasions where uh, the bank did call the note due. Uh, obviously, you can pay off the underlying mortgage uh, if they call it due, uh, but this fix has worked uh, on those occasions. Uh, a major concern that is not talked about uh, very often in these transactions, but it is a, a, a critical issue, and, and the most often seen issues or, or problems with mortgage wraps is the insurance. Um, so, so I'm parroting words from a uh, insurance uh, broker, uh, insurance agent, but what's, what needs to occur is the buyer is going to purchase new insurance. The seller does not need to maintain insurance and, and actually can't maintain insurance. You can't have insurance on a property you don't own. Um, seller could get that insurance policy. It's just uh, a, a nullity. It's not going to provide any, any insurance coverage. Uh, seller is listed as an additional interest on the new insurance policy. Lender, uh, the underlying lender, the Wells Fargo lender is going to be listed as a mortgagee's clause. The seller is also listed as a mortgagee's clause, but that's, that's getting too technical probably. Uh, and the insurance agent must be familiar with mortgage wrap insurance on how to get a mortgage wrap insurance uh, declaration page up to the uh, lender so that it's checked off correctly. Uh, we have people who, who say, well, my, my, my aunt Betsy's been doing my my uh, insurance forever. And I called her and I asked her if she knows how to do this type of insurance. She said yes. And invariably uh, after close, they call us, they ask us how to do the insurance. And I tell them I, I can't advise on, on how that deck page looks. So you, you've got to use a, an agent that knows what they're doing. And as I said, the failure to get insurance correctly in place is the most common reason for a mortgage wrap to fail. So with that said, I suggest these two agents on, on every transaction that, that I close, if, uh, if someone says they're not going to use one of these two agents, then I ask them to sign a, a one page document that says, uh, I understand that uh, we're not going to use uh, uh, your preferred or your, not preferred actually, uh, your suggested uh, insurance agents. We understand that uh, failure to get the insurance in place uh, will cause the mortgage up to fail. And we really, and we understand that it is likely going to fail and we uh, release uh, your offices from any liability in regard to this failure. That usually cause them to understand, okay, we're being serious. I've had one person uh, say, I don't care. I'm still going to use my guy. And they signed off on the, on the sheet. Uh, now, uh, this is, this is talking about the end buyer. Um, they have to use the agent investors who have agents that they've been using uh, and, and know how to do this type of, uh, of insurance, then that, that, that's fine. I'm not talking about those folks. I'm talking about end buyer who's going to just use the local agent they've been using all the time. They're not going to know how to do it. So the, the insurance arm is, is the most important. All right. So contracting, how, how on earth do we contract to do a, a mortgage wrap? And it's, it's spectacularly simple. We're going to use the Trek one to four document. We don't need to get fancy and start using uh, any documents in, uh, that, that are, that are, homegrown, and we're definitely not going to use any uh, documents that are outside the state of Texas. 
that is a recipe for disaster. Um, we had we had someone come out of California and say, "Well, I'm going to do a lease purchase option, and here's my form." And uh, lease purchase options aren't aren't viable here in Texas. So um, we're just going to stick with the Trek one to four, and then you're going to either use the loan assumption addendum or the seller financing addendum. Whether it's a, a subject to you're using the assumption seller finance addendum uh, for the uh, the mortgage wrap transaction. Hello, There's I have the, a quick question, sir. Yeah, good. Um, so uh, Mike Rusica, who is a uh, kick butt seconds investor. Um, he had a question about uh, force placed insurance and where would force placed insurance fit into this, this model? It, would it happen to be if you didn't get insurance and you canceled the underlying insurance on the underlying note, then the, the, the lender would put force placed insurance on the first lien. So, so either don't have insurance or have done the insurance incorrectly. Mm. The, they didn't know what type of deck page to send up there. And so um, that's how that's how they fail. So the, the way it occurs is insurance wasn't done correctly. Uh, letter goes out, says, hey, insurance wasn't right. Uh, we're we're going to put force place insurance. Parties don't understand what that means to begin with. Uh, so then uh, force place insurance gets gets placed on there. It's about two or three times the cost of the, of the normal insurance. And so uh, the monthly payment goes up in buyer doesn't know the monthly payments has gone up or, or what have you. They're still sending the, the, the lower amount. And uh, now the, the uh, loan is in default for insufficient payment and, uh, and or the, the buyer can't afford the new insurance. So um, that's, that's the scenario that you're talking about. Once the fourth place insurance gets on there, then it causes the, uh, the, the mortgage lender to uh, increase the payments and, and the thing fail or the, the other the other side is uh, the incorrect insurance causes the mortgage lender to go out there and look at the entire uh, facts and circumstances regarding the the property. I.e., they're going to do a title search. They see that their collateral has been sold, and so now they they call the note due. And so. um, great, excellent. And so a lot of folks in my that I, I associate with in this space, we're non-performing note investors, and typically the stuff we see get. There is no insurance. The taxes are behind. Um, and so when we get our non-performing notes, we end up having to put force placed insurance. And so uh, a lot of people are thinking that when you go into these assets, that if they're not paying or they're behind on their mortgage, that there's not insurance in place. And, and so from my experience and so far, um, that's, that's not true. What, what I see happening is the, the banks are actually um, doing a corporate advance. So the banks are, are paying the taxes and the existing insurance and keeping those current, and they're they're holding that as a that as a corporate advance and uh, as part of the payout. Is that what you're seeing in, yeah. in these deals, Alan? Yep, a absolutely. When when as you're acquiring the property, they're usually a distressed uh, situation, and um, the the banks have come and fronted the taxes and the insurance, mm -hmm. so they're still in place. And so subsequently, that's why the that's uh, typically going to be your largest chunk of your capital in these deals is catching the arrears, the late payments, the legal fees, the back taxes, the insurance, all that, all that has to be kind of brought to the table when you close. Yep. And I'm, I'm making a note to include that in my slides for now. On. <laughs> um, yeah, I happen to, I, I associate with a lot of note investors. And, and so we get the ugly paper where, it's been cast off and cast off and, and, and let go and forgot about. And, and so we're like, okay, let's rehab this and figure out how to get this going again. Yeah. Uh, no, absolutely. The, the, the reinstatement is the, uh, is the uh, biggest portion of the, of the cost to, to get into one of these, one of these uh, uh, wrap transactions, uh, subject to transaction. Thank you, Alan. You got it. Um, on the, uh, if it's seller finance wrap, then you're using that form 26-7. Uh, those are on the Trek, Trek website. You can uh, just download those. However, uh, you'll see we've, we've modified uh, our forms. Uh, we'll detail, detail later, but you can email us for, for those forms also. Um, I have a, a, a wrap addendum notice uh, and some disclosure forms. Uh, it's about a six or seven uh, wrap disclosure form and uh, I don't like it to be used on every transaction. Uh, we used to do that, but 
when you when you have a, a one size fits all uh, notice and disclosure form, it, it it's going to be over inclusive uh, uh, if, if it's subject to versus a wrap or wrap versus subject to because it's trying to control both. Now I just say get our our, our wrap addendum notice or disclosure. Uh, look through there and cherry pick what's needed uh, for yours and, and put those in the special provisions. Um, then you go receive the contract with a, an attorney title office. I always say, uh, uh, if you're not using our uh, attorney title office, make sure you are using a attorney owned title office, one that one that specializes in this area and knows what they're doing. Uh, we just had a client that uh, said he was going to go uh, take take his work over to a, a different title office uh, because uh, they 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 did wraps and it was uh, cheaper than than our costs uh we're, we're about middle of the road in terms of our cost and uh, i said okay well be careful but in uh in six months let me know if they're doing as good a job uh, as we are and if it's worth saving a, a few dollars and uh I, I bet you a dollar that you're going to say it wasn't worth it it was my bet and he almost made it 30 days and he's coming back and saying hey look let's talk about about y'all so you, you using a, a a practicing attorney in this arena title office uh, or or us I, I, I like us. I think we do a good job, but uh, make sure you use the one. You know, Alan, I've had quite a few people say, hey, can, what forms are you using? Can I get your forms? And, and they're in a different state. And I'm like, well, you need to, you need to, and that's that exact same thing you just said. You find a title company with a lawyer who does this stuff every day because what's going to happen is you're going to bring them a contract and they're, you're going to pay them to figure it out. You're going to pay them to have, figure out how to do a wrap mortgage and you don't have time for that. And you don't have the capital for that. <laughs> yeah, the, the <clears throat> way to, to go find someone is go to one of the real estate uh, groups, one of the real estate uh, e email uh, groups and uh, post uh, an email that says, Hey, do y'all know a good attorney uh, title office that does wraps and, and you'll get, you'll get uh, you know, a dozen or so. Uh, so that's, that's how you find them out of state. And you definitely, you, you, you don't take your forms across state lines. Uh, they, they do not transfer over there. You, you, can, you can read them for some of the niceties and, and steal some stuff, but they're not going to work in another state. And I say the rest runs like normal, uh, sort of. Uh, there's, you know, uh, issues in regard to tax prorations that need to be attended to by the title office. Uh, I'm not going to bore you all with the exacts and all this stuff. The uh, escrow account needs to be uh, looked at. Uh, if it's a foreclosure, there's some niceties that need to occur there. Um, so it, it runs like normal on, on, on the buyer and the seller side title side is, is there's some other, other wheels that are turning uh, behind the scenes. So how do we, uh, how do we contract specifically for a, a wrap? Um, so contracting for the purchase for the subject to, um, on paragraph three, your purchase price is going to say C special provisions. Now, the reason, the reason we're doing that is because our, our purchase price on a subject to is the, the remaining balance of the loan. So when on, on March 20th, uh, we enter into a, a purchase agreement and the payoff is $127,000. And then we're gonna close on April 10th, that payoff is no longer $127,000, it's gone up or down. And so we're going to say see special provisions, we're gonna check off loan assumption addendum, and then on paragraph 11, we're going to state Purchase price is the assumption of the amount of the payoff of the existing mortgage at time of closing. That way, it it, it may seem like it's uh, not necessarily needed. Hey, 127,000, but we get to closing. It's 126,500. That's fine. However, you still owe the 127,000 dollars from a contractual standpoint. You need a contract in, in order for title to close that. And if the seller wants to be fussy and doesn't want to amend that contract, well, not, now you're paying more than, than you have to. Um, on the loan assumption addendum that we're gonna use with the subject to, or assumption transaction, um, you're gonna, as we're acquiring this property, as the investor is buying this property, uh, we're, we're, we're not gonna have in there pa the, the paragraph A on the loan assumption addendum where they're confirming our credit. So we're gonna remove that we're going to remove the credit approval and there's some uh, archaic uh, terms that are in there. Uh, paragraph D, the loan assumption terms. It doesn't exist anymore because it's not a qualified assumption. Uh, consent by note holder, Mr. Wells and Mr. Fargo is not going, they're not going to send us a little email that says we approve of this. So we've taken paragraph E out. 
And then uh, I have some forms with these things uh, removed. Uh, email us if you want the, the loan assumption addendum. I know I'm going quickly on this, but I think you said they're going to, uh, folks are going to have access to this uh, offline. Is that correct, Brady? Matter of fact, I've been uh, sending them the links to these files off your website. Oh, well, e even better. All right, thanks, sir. Uh, okay, so now on the sale, this is the, the mortgage wrap transaction, seller finance via mortgage wrap. Uh, somewhat similar, however, in paragraph three, we're going to use the amount of the town payment, the loan amount. And the total, so we get to we get to fill out paragraph three, just normally uh, like we would for any any seller finance transaction. Uh, it's just we have a loan amount, and then we're going to check off seller finance addendum, and then uh, paragraph eleven. Uh, again, I my I have some Trek one to four documents that have these hard coded in there. Uh, you can get that from us, um, but I, I take this opportunity in paragraph eleven to yet tell them again. This is a mortgage wrap finance transaction. The existing mortgage loan won't be paid off. Uh, there's a due on sale clause, et cetera. Um, the, the reason I do that is because um, we'll, we'll close transactions sometimes and we'll have the, the, the uh, seller or buyer come back and say, well, gosh, I, I, I didn't know this was a mortgage wrap transaction. So I like to tell them approximately 31 times in all of my documents, and that's not a, that's not a false number. There's 31 indications that it's a mortgage wrap transaction. And then I think they have to sign off or initial in 19 places. So uh, anytime you can disclose this, an extra time is good. Uh, so the seller finance addendum is, is really just going to be uh, you know, quite quite simply completed, just like it's a seller finance. Paragraph C is going to be the amount and the interest uh, rate. Um, then you're going to say what the payments are. This is just the P&I payment, the principal and interest payment. Uh, the taxes and insurance are governed by what they are. So it's, it's not the PITI payment in, in this. Um, and then you're going to say, uh, you're going to check off that consent's required for them to sell. While we're over here uh, uh, taking a property subject to and not telling or asking the uh, underlying lender, if they're going to sell our, our note or sell our, our, our collateral, we want to actually be able to consent to that. And then you also need to check off that escrow is required. And so um, I don't think, I don't have a, a, a form of seller finance addendum because we didn't make any changes to the track form. And so you can just use one straight off the website. Quick question, if I could back up for a sec. Yeah. Um, in C, is this, you're gonna put the terms of the underlying promissory note? No, the new note. So, so uh, purchase it by assuming 120,000, I'm selling it for 150,000. Uh, we'll assume I'm selling it for 160,000. Mm -hmm. They're bringing 20,000 down, I've got a $140,000 note right there on the amount and the interest rate, which is obviously negotiable. Um, you know, we, we, we see everything from five to, oh, you know, 9%. Whenever I start seeing double digits, I, I start getting a little bit concerned because that could be a, a, an issue on a, a buyer's ability to repay. Um, but yeah, this is the new note. Okay. So if I don't have a buyer already wrapped up, I'm, I'm just trying to get the house property under contract subject to, I won't use a seller finance addendum just yet. Correct. That's correct. Yeah, you're, you're just using the loan assumption addendum and this is gonna come in whenever you're reselling. Excellent, thank you. Okay. Um, all right, so the, the, I'm gonna talk a little bit uh, about the, the legal side of things, but I, I, I wanna mention it just in case you're out there and, and someone's saying you don't need uh, certain documents, but the, the closing documents, um, if, if you have a, uh, a wrap, um, well, I say if you have a wrap or assumption, but you need a full set of documents. You need the promissory note, deed of trust, warranty deed with vendor's lien. And um, you, you, like I said, some attorneys will advise you just need a warranty deed to secure assumption. And, and my opinion is that that's, that leaves you at risk. Um, it, it, it leaves you, in my opinion, susceptible to a, a seller saying, well, gosh, um, look, the, the, the loan documents don't allow me a right to foreclose if they default. Uh, they, they don't have a promissory note saying that they even have to make a payment to me at all. You get in front of a judge and you don't have a full set of loan documents and all you have is a, a, a warranty deed giving you the property with, uh, with no obligations to pay the mortgage and no redemption rights in the event of default, I think the judge is gonna throw you uh, out of the courthouse on your butt. Um, um, additionally, um, a seller, you know, you'll, you'll enter into a, uh, a um, 
subject to transaction. There's 20 years left on the on the mortgage, and our our maturity date is going to be the same maturity date that was that the the seller had. So fast forward three, four years, this seller is now uh, got their credit back in, in, in order and they're wanting to go out there and get a new, uh, a new mortgage. If we have the correct documentation, they can take their promissory note, show uh, good payments uh, over, the, over the past three, four years. And then that lender can now take this mortgage off of their debt to income ratios and, and more easily allows them to get a, a new mortgage. Um, I, I think it's imperative to include that opportunity. Otherwise, when, when the seller is able to go out there and get a new mortgage, but we don't have the documentation to allow them to do that, they're going to start going it up trying to figure out how we can bust this thing. So let, let's uh, look at some uh, examples using numbers. Um, so let's say we've got a, a payoff of 120,000. Uh, we're not going to pay the seller uh, any dollars. We're just taking over their note and uh, the buyer's paying uh, all closing costs, which is obviously typical when we have distressed seller situation. So the contract's going to be, uh, as we uh, as we said, paragraph three sale price and see paragraph eleven. Uh, purchase price is the assumption amount. Buyer to pay all closing costs, and uh, I say we must have an option period allowing the buyer to withdraw if uh, un unknown liens are, are found uh, during the title search. We're going to go through a, 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 what I call an option escape clause here in a second. Um, you, you need to have a, uh, a, a an option escape. Uh, you can have an option period that is uh, as long as the uh, close date if you want to, but if the seller doesn't want to allow that, then we'll be looking at an option escape clause here in a second. And, and you're going to use the loan assumption addendum on the buy side. Uh, same, type, same type transaction here, but only one change. Seller to receive $3,000. So that language is now just... Uh, purchase price is the assumption of the amount of payoff of the existing mortgage plus three thousand to seller. Um, you need to uh, again, you need to have an option escape clause if if there's uh, something that comes up and we're saying buyer to pay all closing costs, seller to net three thousand, but we didn't consider the uh, you know, uh, let's say there was a, an unknown HOA lien and now we can't pay the seller three thousand. You're, you're going to want that uh, option escape clause to, to allow you to eject out if the seller, you know, we, there's a thousand dollars owed to the HOA. We say, well, now seller, you're only getting two thousand, and they say, no, we can we can bust out. And now on, on this, you're still using the loan assumption addendum. Now on the on the wrap side, payoff is one twenty, but our our purchase price is two ten. We're going to bring twenty thousand down, so we're going to have a. a in paragraph three, we're going to have the hundred and ninety thousand dollar loan, and check off the seller finance addendum. Uh, so this is a this is a typical seller finance structure here. We're 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 we don't care about the payoff uh, in our contracting. Uh, we're not mentioning anything in regard to uh, the the amount that uh, is remaining on that loan. It's just a seller finance transaction uh, on the track one to four. And, and we're using the seller finance addendum. So this, you know, this is where people start to get confused. They, they think, well, gosh, this is a mortgage wrap. We, we've got to structure this contract uh, like it's a mortgage wrap, and you don't. It's just seller financing. Um, mm -hmm. I've, I've hired escrow officers, and, and uh, you know, if, if they come from conventional title, and one, one escrow officer sat here for almost three months, confused as heck about these mortgage wrap transactions, and then finally a light bulb went off and they said, well, it's just seller finance. I said, I, I know that's why I was telling you it's seller finance for the past three months, but it's, it's, it's easier than it looks. Um, I put this in here. It's not necessarily uh, applicable to just mortgage wraps, but um, on your, on your earnest money uh, it's not required. Um, if if y'all are using the de minimis uh, uh, earnest money of $10 or $5 or what have you, because uh, someone told you you have to have it to support consideration for the Trek one to four, uh, they're wrong, um, and you don't need earnest money. That ten dollar or five dollar earnest money can frustrate the transaction if it's trying to terminate. Um, if you if you have to have that ten or five dollar uh, earnest money, releasing having the buyer release that over to the seller will avoid some of the uh, the uh, problems uh, uh, that 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 ten dollar earnest money can have. Uh, if, if again, a terminating. And then this is not the same in regard to the option fee. 
you cannot put, I have a 20 day option period for $0. The option contract has to be supported by, by consideration. It's a mini contract inside of the Trek one to four contract. So please, please no one say Alan Sesker said, you don't have to have an option fee because that, 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 will, that will void your right to an option. Um, so do, I, do I need title insurance for a wrap? Um, and I almost want to tell you not to put this uh, out publicly because um, the attorney answer is going to always be yes. Uh, you want to avoid risk at all costs. Uh, if you own a title company, then your answer is going to be yes, because that's how we make our money. Um, and that's why I don't want you to put this public because it's going to be talking about do we, do we actually need it. But at any rate, uh, if there's a lender uh, in a transact in a conventional transaction, yes, yeah, yeah, that they're going to require it. And the investor answer is it depends. And so uh, usually it's the lawyer saying it depends, but this time it's the, the investor saying it depends. Uh, it's a risk benefit analysis. So um, if you're assuming a property, you're taking a property subject to, and uh, let's say that um, you're, you're, you're just taking it over. It's actually not in, in, in default at the time. Uh, seller can't sell it and make any money to pay uh, the real estate agents, et cetera. And so you're, you're spending, Three thousand uh, dollars for a full closing, uh, title insurance and and uh, uh, settlement fees and, and all of the things that are needed. Um, but you're doing that to protect a, a, a two thousand dollar insurance policy. I did that reverse, but why would why yeah why are you protecting that three thousand dollar outlay with a two thousand dollar insurance policy? It's kind of like when I go to Best Buy and I buy a you know a little cheapo technology piece of technology for 200 bucks and they say well do you want to get the warranty for 50 50 dollars my answer is no uh, so uh, it, it's it's not necessarily needed in that scenario uh, however um, you, you've got to look at the, uh, the the title commitment um, if if we've got uh, deceased parties in title uh, got some uh, liens and judgments against the seller um, or, or other factors, you know, we have a quick claim deed in the chain of title. Anything that causes, uh, uh, anything listed on Schedule C that doesn't say everything's clean, then you're back over to probably want the title policy. So I, I will tell you that uh, uh, on my assumptions uh, that I take, uh, my, my subject to purchases, I, I, I don't get title insurance. On my sales side, I let the buyer decide if title insurance is needed or not. Uh, now, uh, out of complete disclosure, I am an attorney, don't have to hire an attorney. If there's a problem, I can fix it. Um, so maybe that's why I'm a little bit uh, less risk averse. Um, all right, so how, how does the title office or the, or the law office work in, in, in terms of wraps? Um, so if you're, if you're using our title office, um, when to engage our office? Uh, I wanna be involved uh, at the contracting stage before everyone signs off. Uh, if there's a, an omission or, or some type of amendment that needs to occur to allow to allow closing to occur, uh, and, and title says, hey, uh, need to get this amendment here, the seller had someone come behind you and say, hey, I'll pay you $1,000 more. Well, the seller's not gonna allow that amendment. So the contracting needs to be, needs to be perfect. Uh, so uh, before once the contract's completed and before the party signed, uh, I, I provide a, a free service where I'll review that contract and uh, um, gosh, it takes me you know, probably seven minutes to review that contract and send it back to you and, and let you know. Now I should have put in there the proviso. It's if you're closing with my title office. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not altruistic and, and like helping the world. Uh, it's, it's still a business, but I can, uh, I can bounce that review back to you in, in you know, 10 minutes. So we're not going to slow your contracting down. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's helpful to, to make sure that we have it correct in, in the beginning. Um, so what to include with, with your receipted contract, this is, this isn't really necessarily, uh, applicable to just wraps or subject twos, uh, really, uh, it'd be a good business practice to u utilize this in all of your transaction. Now here, here's the, here, ready, here's the fancy part of the, uh, of the slideshow. Ready? Yeah. Everything. That's what we want to include with the receipted contract. Um, I don't know how I made that do that, but it's pretty fancy. Uh, so. Uh, in a mortgage wrap transaction, um, you're, you're going to have your, your, your seller finance loan assumption addendum, um, HOA information that, that's applicable to all transactions, but you're going to get an authorization to speak to the lender at time of contracting. You're going to provide, uh, mo mo most clients get one for themselves 
and one for, for my law office to, to uh, uh, speak to the lender. Um, so I'm going to have you uh, uh, go ahead and get a, 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 just take a picture of, of their current ID. Get a picture of your current ID. Ship those off. We're going to ask for them anyway. Now, after you give my team uh, your ID on one transaction, obviously you have to give it on the next transaction. Um, and sometimes they do ask for it because, in, in theory, we're supposed to. Every file is supposed to be uh, a, uh, a a completely contained um, uh, transaction and not look back to the to the past. But at any rate, talk talk to the talk to your good escrow officers and, and say, hey, you already got it. There's a, a buyer information form that needs to be filled out. So I always say, take our form. Uh, I'll send it to you in Word version if if we have it in Word version still, uh, or manipulate our PDF uh, document. Put your logo on there and, and have the buyer, the buyer fill out the buyer information form, have the seller fill out the seller information form and put that, bring that with your, your package. Um, and then you're gonna get the existing loans, uh, current statement, the payoff, and the reinstatement. Um, the, uh, the payoff uh, is needed even if, if, if it's a, uh, a mortgage wrap transaction or what have you, you wanna you want see that payoff. Um, you're also gonna need a copy of the existing note. Um, on a subject to or assumption, uh, what we're saying is uh, we're, we're going to take over the obligations of the attached note. So you need to copy that promissory note, A. B, if you're taking over a promissory note and you haven't seen that promissory note, that's a risk. It could be an adjustable rate mortgage, could have a, a balloon uh, date. Um, there could be a, a modification uh, that, that has occurred. So. Uh, I actually don't have to have it to draft up the loan documents. I can, I can amend the loan documents, but you need it from a good business practice. Uh, there, there's no reason not to uh, make sure there, there's, there's not a problem with that note. I sat down at a closing one time. Uh, folks didn't get the promissory note, and, and thank goodness uh, at closing. And I think the, uh, I think the mortgage wrap, was, it was only about a four-year mortgage wrap or so, but the seller said, well, so this thing balloons in a year. What happens then? I uh, said, well, uh, everything fails. We need to change this transaction. Uh, so uh, get that promissory note. Um, um, you know, that, uh, that topic, um, that Fort Worth property, it, um, it had a, a big fat balloon at the end. It was a loan mod. Oh, yeah. When I sat down to the numbers, I'm like, oh, man, I've got like $600 a month cash flow. This would be amazing. And, and then I realized I saw the note. It had a big fat balloon. So what I did is I re-amateurized oh. to make sure that, uh, that as they're paying the first, I'm paying off, I re-amortized the underlying lien so that the timeline payoff, when it pays off, when the maturity date shows, there'll be a zero balance at the maturity date. Well, it does, it does help, help to be a note expert, I guess, also. <laughs> and so that's, that's, exactly, that's exactly why I think this is a perfect um, opportunity for note investors because we understand amortization rates and reading the, the, the terms of a note and, and these type of things. And so it, the, our learning curve for us, for note investors in deal analysis is much shorter. It, it wasn't a very long learning curve. But as you were going through those things, I'm like, okay, I didn't do that. Yeah, I didn't. Oh man. Because for me, I don't get in front of sellers. I don't get in front of homeowners and go through, you know, trek one to fours. Yeah. I'm, I'm on with asset managers and, calling hedge funds and whatnot, but dealing with the, the seller, I'm, I, I totally jacked everything up according to that. <laughs> Good. Uh, I guess maybe I should just give this uh, presentation to anyone who's coming in doing a, a, a mortgage wrap. I hadn't thought about that. <clears throat> All right. So, so uh, what, what, what is the title office going to do? We'll, we'll go through this quickly because it's not necessarily imperative in regard to wraps, but just to let y'all know, once that contract is receded, there's going to be a title search to, to make sure the, the seller can sell the property, make sure they're the vested owners and there's not a problem with that vesting. No, no deceased uh, parties in chain of title, uh, no, no kind of uh, quick claim deeds. Um, then they, they also search buyer and seller to make sure there's no problems with buyer and seller. Um, then a, a title commitment is going to be provided. Uh, review schedule C. I've got a presentation in regard to how to read the uh, title commitment. Maybe uh, if, if that's of any interest for the folks, we can come back on at a later time and, and go through that title commitment review. Um, but you have to review Schedule C. Schedule C is going to be uh, all of the, the uh, all of the items that need to be uh, resolved in some form or fashion in order for the, the transaction to close. So if there's a, a mortgage, 
it's going to be listed in Schedule C. Now, if it's a, a wrap, we're going to move that back over to Schedule B so it doesn't have to be resolved. But reviewing Schedule C could show you that there's a HUD loan on this thing. It'll show you if there was a modification on this thing. Um, it, it'll show HOA liens, mechanics liens, all, all of those types of things. So Schedule C is important to review right when it comes out. Schedule A and B, not so much, unless schedule unless you're planning on doing some construction on the property, you need to review Schedule B. And then um, title is going to clear all title issues and defects. So if there's uh, liens on the property that we can get removed, we're going to remove those. Um, take care of uh, uh, affidavit of airships on the seized parties, et cetera. Uh, all the stuff that title does in the background. Um, then a, a settlement statement will be created. Uh, schedule that closing and uh, and uh, send out all docs for signing. Um, for a wrap transaction, uh, we what, what we do that's a little bit different. If this is a conventional program, is um, we're gonna we're gonna manage a transaction. But we're gonna educate the parties. Uh, I uh, I provide a uh, a phone call with all the parties uh, prior to contracting or after contracting to discuss what a mortgage wrap is uh, if needed. Uh, I think it's a, a very, very valuable tool to to make sure that we don't run into that situation in, in you know two years after closing where a seller says, "Well, I, I you know I didn't understand it's a mortgage wrap," um, and we go back to the you know hour long conversation we have with the attorney where we discuss the mortgage wrap. Um, process takes from one week to six weeks. One week is very very fast, but we're doing that all the time to save uh, um, foreclosures. Uh, six weeks is uh, a little bit long, but that's if there's deceased parties and things of that nature. But that's kind of the best, that's the lifespan in general uh, statement of what, what, what title office does. Um, give yourself plenty of time to close on the contract. So if, if, this, if this is two weeks out from, uh, from uh, foreclosure and you say, well, I'm, I want to I close this in one week, put, put, the, put the foreclosure date as your close date. Uh, if it's not a foreclosure property and, and you're going to try to, uh, uh, get it closed quick. Go, go, go ahead and give yourself plenty of time. W what we run into a lot is um, there's a deceased party. We're trying to get an affidavit of airship in place. We're working with the seller to, to get that affidavit of airship to be dragging their feet or confused or not filling the, the questionnaire out completely, et cetera. And, and now the, the closing date comes and we say, all right, we need to amend the closing date and extend it. They say, well, you didn't close on time, so we're, we're, we're not going to, we're not going to go forward with the transaction. They can't do that. Uh, they're, if, if title can't close because of seller defects, then seller can't just terminate, but they, they, they think they do, or think they can. So if there's more time and we don't run into that issue, then that's good. You can always close on or before that date. That's a good tip. So what, what, what should you do during this, uh, this process? Uh, stay poised and ready to get all the information. A lot of times the investor is point of contact with the seller and point of contact with them buyer. So um, you can you can either tell title, hey, uh, I don't want to be involved at all. Let this thing run like a transaction. Um, contact seller or contact buyer and, and, and run with them. Or sometimes an investor is the only point of contact. But stay poised and ready because if if you're out of it and we're dealing with the seller and they're being non-responsive, we'll, we'll reach out to you to get you involved. Um, so tell us how you prefer to contact. Um, I went over that. Uh, keep in touch with the seller and buyer. Um, We'll, we'll, we'll keep in touch with them, but you know, I, per, per, perhaps maybe people see uh, emails from the title team and just click delete. Um, and, and then they'll, they'll call us and say, what the heck's going on with this transaction? Uh, if y'all are keeping the other, the unsavvy parties uh, aware via phone calls and that, that's good. Um, make sure the closing logistics don't change. People out of town, sick, um, um, don't just, just don't want to close the way they said they were going to close because we'll be asking for those logistics. And then uh, other than that, stand by to stand by. Um, title will, it, the, the reason I say this is simple is because once you get that Trek one to four contract and you got everyone under a contract, you hand the title, they're gonna hold your hand. They're gonna tell you everything that you need to do. There's, there's no, uh, no secrets that you need to know in order to get this thing closed. Um, here's that option escape clause. Um, so, and I just, I just, you know, got, got some general language here that states that it's agreed that um, uh, the purchaser can get the earnest money back, isn't obligated to complete the purchase if, and I say if, not, not because there's no magic uh, uh, one size fits all 
statement here. You could have a uh, payoff of, of existing loan is greater than X. Uh, uh, you could say a total purchase price, including the assumption of ex existing loan, exceeds X. Uh, we failed to appraise at or above purchase price. Uh, bottom line, you just insert some type of valid contingency that's applicable with this transaction, and that allows you to have that, that option escape clause uh, in, the, in the event that this thing's not meeting your specific criteria. Um, so we've closed, uh, um, we've, we've got our down payment and, uh, this thing's cash flowing. So we're getting our, our monthly payments. What, what, what are you supposed to do? Um, make, monitor, monitor the payments. Um, if you're not using a loan servicing company, especially make sure everyone's getting the money they're supposed to be getting. Uh, underlying lender is receiving their money. You're receiving your money, uh, et cetera. Um, you know, you can, you can assign these transactions. So instead of it being an ABBC, you're just going to get a, an assignment fee, and now uh, uh, the owner is selling the property to an end user. Um, in those situations, uh, I see a lot of people will just uh, say, "I'm done" and go away. But be ready for a phone call from Title to help in, in the event of a problem. Uh, loan servicing companies can make errors. Uh, mortgage companies can make mistakes. Uh, you know, we've we've seen where they. Um, don't don't understand that the insurance uh, has been in place and and now they've jacked up the payments for the fourth place insurance or something and it was all an error. Uh, escrow accounts can uh, as I was going to say can change will change, and so those payments are going to change. So if the, the taxes went up, um, then that that payment over to the lender is going to be the same. But you got to keep keep track of that. Uh, monitor the uh, insurance. Uh, if you're selling uh, the property via mortgage wrap, make sure that you're a mortgagee. Uh, have mortgagee interest on the insurance, and so you'll you'll be told that the insurance is not uh, kept up. So so be ready for that. Um, if if you don't want this as a long term hold, uh, there's a fellow up there in, in DFW area named Eddie Johansson, and uh, he he has a a very very good credit repair program. So if you want these people to refi out, especially if you have a balloon payment in, in two years or three years, mm. uh, uh, and these people are supposed to pay it off. Get them into a credit repair program. You can even engineer that credit repo, uh, the cost for that credit repair program into the monthly payments. Uh, but Eddie is a uh, he, he he he'll be classified as a freak in the in the credit and knowledge of the of the credit uh, companies and and knowing their internal matrices, et cetera. Um, oh, I did put his name in there. And then uh, I always say, don't call the mortgage company and tell people, don't call the mortgage company. Um, and also, uh, don't don't send up your power of uh, attorney that I draft up and your authorization up to the mortgage company unless you need to talk with them. First, you send the authorization and say, hey, I need, to, I need to talk with this. The POA is kind of an authorization on steroids. Uh, if they're not recognizing or, or, or accepting the authorization, then we send the POA. The POA is also going to, the power of attorney is also going to have my office uh, as authorized to talk. And so... Lo and behold, uh, uh, Joe, Joe Q. Public uh, sends up the power of attorney calls and says, hey, I want to talk to y'all. And they say no. And then the law office calls and says, I have a power of attorney, so therefore I'm representing the individual. They've, assigned, they've um, um, allowed me access to this and have asked me for to help them as their attorney and agent, and you're not going to, to recognize my power of attorney. And then all of a sudden we're talking with them. So, uh, But you don't, you don't need to send that until needed. The power of attorney also uh, allows you to, um, when, when, when the loan gets paid off, there's going to be an escrow balance. The uh, escrow check is going to be sent back to, um, hopefully to you, because you've changed the uh, address to, to have this, the, all the information come to you. Well, that check's going to come to you, that escrow refund, refund check. Um, I've got a typo there, darn it. Uh, the escrow refund check is going to come to you, but it's going to be made out to, to you know, Sam Seller uh, or Bob Barber. And so my power of attorney allows you to uh, endorse that check and, and deposit that check. Uh, we, we don't take that POA uh, over to the bank and say, hey, I want to deposit this check in my account. We're allowed to endorse a check per the power of attorney. We endorse it, we deposit it, preferably through an ATM machine. So there's not a human over there to, to check and make sure that they're going to accept things. Um, if you take the POA into the bank and, and attempt to, to deposit or cash that check, they're in all likelihood going to say no. So those are the items that you do and, and, and don't do. And I think, yeah, 
so so that's the end there. Um, um, here's uh, all of our um, contact information for for our offices. Uh, there's the uh, email address for Jessica. Uh, she's the uh, title liaison. She's the investor liaison for our office. Um, she's a, a powerful individual. For some reason, she thought she could take off two weeks and go to Australia. So I'm going to decrease her pay now so she can't afford that kind of stuff. I've been dying the last two weeks. But mm -hmm. Jessica is the go-to person. If you want to reach me, email Jessica, and it'll get to me quicker than if you email me directly. Uh, if, if you're closing a file at our office and uh, uh, escrow officer is caught in a, 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 a closing or is near end of month, and dear Lord, you can't get a hold of anyone, Jessica's your person. She goes and grabs a person by the scruff of the neck and says, hey, I need an answer to this, and then gets back with you. So she, she, is, the, uh, she is the goddess of, uh, of, of our office uh, and the go-to person. So there you have it, um, Brady. You, I, I guess you take it from here. I don't know if uh, you leave this up here or, or if there's questions. I do. I do have some questions. Um, let's see. And what I can do is I can see. Um, yes. Oh, I, I see the chat area. No, that's a few options. All right. So now it's our our our, our mugs back and forth. So there are a few, a uh, couple of questions. Um, so a lot of note investors, we're used to going to a company like ProTitle and ordering an O&E report. And so what we get from your office is what's a document, it's a, it's a PDF, like from what I could tell, it's about 50 some odd plus pages and it's the title commitment. How far does the title commitment go back? So, <sighs> The, uh, the, the title commitment, let, let, let me stop. A, a title search can be uh, from inception or it can be back to last, uh, last transaction. Um, not, not to get too deep into it, but uh, a, a title search uh, these days is, is really just going back to the last insured transaction. And, and the main reason for that is we're all using the exact same data. Um, you know, there's uh, Bob with the title office and getting his briefcase and walking down to the county uh, records uh, uh, and, and, and doing the manual search. Uh, the, the title agency's uh, membership to the plants, the plant acquires all that information, digitally ships it over to the examiners at the agency, and they, they review it. So as long as there's an insurance transaction, they'll go back to that. Excellent. And... Excellent. Because what you do produce is a what officially is a title commitment for a, a title insurance policy, correct? A, a, a lender's title policy. Yeah. So so it, the commitment is is for uh, not just lender, but all the, the buyer title policy and, and lender uh, title policy. Title policy. Um, however, we're 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 producing if, if it's an uninsured transaction, we're buying a a uh, abstractor's report which is more like just a lien search. It, it will show uh, vested owner, uh, it'll show legal description, and it'll show uh, all uh, voluntary and involuntary liens. And that's what's uninsured. Uh-oh, I think you already went out. Oh, there you are. Um, can the, where do you write the reinstatement amount on the contract? So uh, when you get your, your seller, on the contract, do you write the, re the potential reinstatement amount anywhere, or is that not, not necessary? Uh, it, it's it's typically uh, it's typically not on the contract. And now I do see times where, uh, in special revisions, it says uh, buyer to pay reinstatement amount of X, mm -hmm. just to make sure it's clear. Now I always, if, if I'm representing the investor buyer on, on that transaction, I'm not going to have them write in their uh, additional responsibilities for them. They know they're going to pay the reinstatement. Mm -hmm. uh, not, not putting uh, in, in buyer to pay reinstatement is actually a, a uh, way to parachute out of the transaction if you want to, because strictly speaking, the seller has to pay that. So if, if we said buyer is paying mm -hmm. something comes up and there's a HUD lien or something, then we just it's out. That is a great nugget. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't want it in there. That is a great nugget. Um, Ashley, she's in Houston, and um, and she was wondering, can you do transactions in Houston? And I'm like, uh, of course. I, I took down one in Corpus Christi. I'm in Fort Worth, and 
because you use mobile notaries, right? Yeah. So, so um, <laughs> we have options uh, Austin, Austin, Dallas, and and, uh, and uh, San Antonio. Um, mm-hmm. We 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 close probably about twenty five to thirty percent of our transactions out of Harris County, and they're handled uh, via uh, mail out mobile notaries or if someone wants to go to a sticks and bricks location, we use one of our sister offices. Um, I'm, you know, I'm capital title Seshka group. There's a hundred other offices. I don't own them all, uh, but they, they provide us courtesies, uh, uh, courtesy closing if, if need be. Uh, we expect to get a, an office opened up in Harris County, but uh, it's, it's, it's difficult to find uh, the correct people. Dallas office was easy because a girl that worked with me uh, transferred up to Dallas. And so I got her plugged in. An attorney uh, mans the uh, the San Antonio office. I haven't found someone who can handle these types of transactions uh, down in Harris County yet. Mm-hmm. So if there are any Harris County folks on, they have a a, a good uh, escrow officer, and uh, and that escrow officer is looking for a a job. Please please refer them to me. Excellent. And actually, you will get the replay to this, so you can review this again to so you're comfortable. Going through the contract um, with your with the with the sellers. So, um, let's see. There was uh, well, we got a lot of thanks. People are just really loving this content. Um, let's see. Ashley says that someone from a, a Facebook group advised her she can't use the track because she's not a realtor. So you 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 can't use the TAR, the Texas Association of Realtor Forms. Say uh, on, only us. The Texas Real Estate Commission forms do not have that, that, that copyrighted proviso on there. So uh, you, you, can, you can use them. If you're an agent, you can't change them. Uh, but everyone can use the TREC forms. They're not, they're not copyright protected. Yeah, and matter of fact, you made it clear, use the TREC 1 to 4. Absolutely. Right? Use the TREC 1 to 4 um, on all your transactions. Yeah, and I, I, I can't use a TAR form either. Sometimes I, I actually need one of the TAR forms that the track doesn't have. I, I, I can't touch them either. The, um, you know, Texas has a short foreclosure process, and so you, you're able to get these deals closed in time to stop, to beat the foreclosure? Yeah, so if, if you know, if, if the borrower pulls their, their head out of the sand uh, early and, and we're three, four weeks uh, – from that foreclosure, then that's easy. That's a piece of cake. We'll, we'll have people that come in the, the Wednesday uh, on the week before the foreclosure. That means we only have, you know, real, we really only have Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, because usually the reinstatement has to be sent out Friday. If they need it FedEx by, or received by FedEx, if, they, if it's wire, then we can dip over to Monday. So we're, we're closing these things in four days. We don't like that, but when, like I said, when the seller hasn't, uh, um, re- realize the state that they're in until too late. We, we can still get those closed real fast. Um, we have we have dedicated examiners. Our our title searches are coming back to us during during the foreclosure time. They're coming back to us in well less than one day. That's fantastic. Let's see, Grace says thank you both. Amazing content. Um, I think I've gone through everyone's uh, questions. Uh, restatement amount locations. Excellent. I think we're I think we're done. There's a, there's one question here. It says, mm-hmm. what would what would be the major difference if rather than a sub two acquisition, the existing seller A B side owns free and clear, and the investor negotiates favorable terms, then wrap that to the end buyer. Um, that's uh, so. Oh. That. Uh, it, it, it's fine. Uh, the AB documents need to allow for the, they need to not have the due on sale clause. I've got two different deeds of trust that I have. Well, I've got several different, but in regard to the due on sale, I've got a deed of trust that contains a due on sale clause and a deed of trust that does not. You're going to need to use the one that does not contain the due on sale clause. And that way you can go and then, and then wrap that note. But that, that that's, um, and it's, uh, from Joel, so, Joel, that's that's an absolute prototypical situation whenever properties are free and clear, um, because I, I obviously, uh, well, they may need all their money, but that that's an even better scenario. And to share the power of, of kind of this, um, I helped someone uh, who had a a brand new unseasoned note on a mobile home, 
and uh, I got an 81% of unpaid balance. And he used this whole process. He had an underlying debt, he had an in rat buyer, and unseasoned sold for 81% on the dollar of unpaid balance. So, you know, this is a, a way that you can make secondary notes, uh, notes in a second lien. And when you sell it, he took, what he did is he took the proceeds from that, that sell of that loan, and he paid off the underlying lien. So now his second puts that new buyer in a first lien position. Yeah. Yep. I mean, there's just, there's just a lot of power to this um, tool for uh, note investors, but you, but you're approaching property from a different perspective. Note investors are typically going after either mom and pop trying to sell notes. They're trying to go through the, the banks or hedge funds to, to uh, buy notes. In this case, you're, you're creating notes, but you've got to go through the homeowner first. And so that's a little bit different than what note investors are accustomed to. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It, it, you know, again, it's uh, hands down the most powerful tool for, for real estate investing to leverage your dollars. Fantastic. Uh, Alan, I'm so grateful for you taking your time out tonight to spend with the Fort Worth No Closers Meetup. And um, uh, tonight, I, th this, is, this is really good. I, I, I needed this because as you were going through those slides, I'm like, oh, oh, oh. You know, they say fell, fall, fell going forward, fell falling forward. Yeah, I was like, oh, oh, okay, I need to go get that. <laughs> no, your, your team sent me in the right direction. I, I'll, 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 I, they told me to go get this stuff afterwards, but if I had it in advance, I could have been a better customer for them. So now that I know, I'm going to get these forms in advance and all this content so they don't have to keep sending me emails. So I'd be a better client. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, you know it's, just, it's a good business practice. Um, we you know we have a, a, an engineer. He's a uh, he's a freak. When he brings us uh, a package, it has everything, nice little bow, and he's done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So, um, oh, what areas in Texas do you cover, Alan? You cover the entire state of Texas, don't you? Yeah. So we 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 can close in all two hundred fifty four counties. Um, you know sometimes. If, if, if there's a, a small county, um, it might be better to go direct with them to do the, uh, to do the title side of things. We, we still draft up and, and manage the, the wrap transaction part. But, and the reason I say that is sometimes, sometimes uh, these, these small counties don't want city folk coming into their, into their town and, and, and getting their title work. So, um, we, and, and we'll, we'll tell parties when that's, when that's uh, applicable. Mm. Yeah, we close, we close all over Texas. We've uh, got a deal in Lubbock right now, El Paso, Corpus. Uh, we're, we're all over the place. Excellent. Well, it that looks like that's it for our questions tonight. Um, again, I'm, I'm, I'm just grateful. And, and hopefully we can do this again. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just let me know. We're, 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 we're here to help. Fantastic. Check them out, guys. Uh, the Kesha Group. I have sent all the links to most of the files that he mentioned. We're actually in the chat roles. Um, so if you click on those links and go and save them to your favorites. Um, also, I pasted Eddie Johansson's link information in there too. Um, pretty much everybody he referenced today, I got a link off of screen and then posted in there in, into the chat roll for you. So just trying to add value and content to your investment strategy and help you expand your portfolio. And as always, I guess that's it. We'll say good night. Thanks, Brady. Hey, great. Thanks. And hey, it's smart to be the lean lord and not the landlord. <laughs>